So this, this uh, guy was just minding his own business in Montana. He was herding sheep. And some guy in a BMW drove up, had on some pretty snazzy duds and Blackberry and cell phone, and got the guy's attention and said to him, he said, what are you doing? And the rancher said, I'm herding sheep. He said, um, say, if I tell you how many sheep you have, can I have one? And the rancher says, yeah, that's kind of an odd request, but I think I could do that. So the guy got out his cell phone, and he called NASA, and he had a satellite photograph taken of the, the area. And then he got out his BlackBerry and made a few texts and a calculator, and pretty soon his laptop. And an hour later, he's in the trunk of his car printing out. He has a printer. He's printing out a 150-page report that he gives to the rancher. And he says, you have 837 sheep. The rancher says, yep. He says, well, then it looks like you owe me one. He says, take your pick, son. So the young guy spent another hour going through the herd trying to find the choice animal. Once he gets it, he goes to stuff it in his trunk. And the sheep herder says, uh, say there, partner, before you go, how about if I tell you what you do for a living? You give me back my animal? The guy says, well, yeah, I guess that's fair, sure. He says, well, I figure you're a consultant. <laughs> he says, yeah, how'd you know? He says, well, you showed up when no one asked for you. <clears throat> you told us what we already knew. And you don't know a dang thing about my business. Now, can I have my Cocker Spaniel back? <clears throat> there, was a, there was a vicar who was boasting to his church session that all the time he needed to prepare his Sunday sermons was when he got up in the morning and walked from the manse across the churchyard to the sanctuary. And in those few minutes, God gave him his sermons. And that night, his session voted unanimously to buy him a new house 20 kilometers from the church. <laughs> now, I tell you those two stories for a reason. It's, there's good news and bad news in those stories. The, the bad news is I'm a consultant. <laughs> and and, and the even worse news is for 20 years, I was a minister. Um, but the best news is, is that I live several thousand miles from here. And on the flight over, I, I thought of a few things to say. So um, let me begin. When it comes to barcoding at the point of care, I would suggest that the handwriting is on the wall for hospitals in America. And it won't be long before it's on hospitals on the walls in your country. Uh, some people have already begun. Others will have to get off the dime pretty soon. The meaningful use standards that came out from the ONC even yesterday, even though they're preliminary and we have 10 days to comment, sometimes I think Obama ought to be a railroad engineer. My gosh, <laughs> he's shoving that thing through. But we have 10 days to comment on them. But by year 2013, barcoding has to be, barcoding at the point of care has to be in our repertoire to get the CMS dollars that we all want in our hospitals. My 45 minutes will be devoted to barcoding at the point of care inside the walls of hospitals. They will have applications in other uh, uh, arenas of care, but I will not give attention to those in this period. The program states that I will be talking specifically about bedside uh, barcoding, and I'm going to go away from the bedside. I'm not just going to talk about medication. I'm going to talk about other applications within the hospital. I will give plenty of attention to the medication use. But what I want to do is to set BPOC in the context of the electronic health care record, the EHR, and to help you hopefully see better how it protects not only patients, but also nurses and physicians and even hospitals. I want to show you a video before we move on. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät, das Gerät. Überlebensradar.
Hallo? This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking, we're thinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> Now, miscommunication is not always a matter of of your mother tongue, even within our own languages. We have serious opportunities for miscommunication, and we certainly have them in the hospital with all of our patient care, all of the medicines, all of the people that we deal with, all of the data in our repositories. And um, so mistakes, communication mistakes, are not only costly at sea. They're, they're costly where your loved ones are right now, some of you. Uh, in, in our hospitals. Uh, we have many problems with look-alike and sound-alikes, don't we? Uh, well, let me go back to that. L look at that uh, if I can. I think I can go back. There we go. That's a partial list of drugs that both look and sound alike. Now, probably because most of you are not familiar with those names, you can look at them and see the difference. But the more familiar you are with those names, the greater the opportunity for error. Let me read this to you. Apparently, the order of the letters in a word doesn't really matter that much. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it with little problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole, amazing. Every word in that sentence with more than three letters is misspelled but we can still read it. It not only happens with drug names, it happens with people. What if you have twins and they look alike? Dennis Quaid knows about that, though that wasn't the problem with their medication error because both of them needed the same treatment. Nevertheless, sometimes patients do look alike, and when we get into elderly care homes, they often look more alike. Little babies, older. And how about drugs? There's an adult dose and a baby dose of heparin. Those twins got the adult dose and nearly bled out. Thank God they didn't, like the six twins, or the, like the six children in Indianapolis the year earlier. That's my name. It has six misspellings in it. You didn't know and you didn't care. But if I'm in your hospital, I care. I want you to get the right Mark New and Schwander. And you're laughing because you say, how could there be a wrong Mark New and Schwander? Well, there's a Mark New and Schwander. Do you notice anything different in that name? Tell me what's different. Yeah, the C. I'm a K. You know what else is missing? Two letters. And the guy who told me about this guy, who happens to be uh, an executive with Pharma in Switzerland, didn't even know that his last name spelled differently than mine. <clears throat> There's two more letters there. There's a new father in Seattle named Mark Neuenschwander, and you can guess it's not me. I got snipped a long time ago after my five. <laughs> and... Um, But I got a greeting card in the mail congratulating me on the arrival of my new one. There's a bass player in Tampa, I could wish. He's pretty good looking, a lot younger, and plays a mean bass. There's another donor for World Vision. They mixed up our donor records. That didn't help at tax time. It didn't threaten my life, but it, did, it was troublesome. <clears throat> ASHP in 2004 did a survey and discovered, a patient survey and discovered that the number one fear of patients going into a hospital is will they give me the wrong medications? And it's not an unfounded fear. There is good reason for us to fear what goes on behind the walls of those hospitals.